Um, now, oh jeez, where the hell are we going? Now, the Aralu said people who live on a surface with no world, so I guess it's this planet here because it's a gas giant, because everything else is not a gas giant. So, hopefully, this is the planet where they live, which is strange, really. Hello, visitor. We are the Slylandro. I am content to hover, a Slylandro speaker. Your presence here fills us with excitement. We have gotten so few visitors over these many drawn. We hope you can stay to talk with us for a time. These guys sound a bit like Rich Dog from the Oxcast. Um, pretty sure he was not the one who voiced these. Oh. This but, is uh, yeah, it does sound a bit like that. We will be happy to tell you about ourselves if you would please, please do the same. You see, we Slylandro have been extremely interested in learning about the galaxy, but our physique makes us incapable of leaving our gas giant home. Therefore, we are totally reliant on our infrequent visitors to keep us informed about events outside this planetary system. And visitors usually only show up every few drawings. We hope that our newly deployed exploration probe fleet will not only gather information for us, but inform other races of our presence here as well. You know, these guys seem nice, but I think it's time to get straight to the point. What probes are these guys you know, talking it's about? Funny. We hadn't heard from the outside galaxy in a whole Janossa. And then the Melba may come by and sell us a probe. And just a few hundred locations later, you show up. Oh, the probes? Right! Well, like we said, just a short time ago, a race called the Melnome stopped by. They said they had acquired some information revealing our existence, and they wanted to study us, if we didn't mind. In fact, the Melnome said they would pay us for the right to do so. I guess they are biology nuts or something. Anyway, in exchange for our information, they gave us a probe vessel. Well, we've got quite a lot to ask them, but uh, first of all, can they give us any details about these probes? Sure, if you are interested. In exchange for information about the life on source, the Melnor may offer to give us a remote exploration probe. It would roam the galaxy gathering information and contacting alien races, and when it had filled its data storage units, it would return here and reveal to us everything it had learned. So why do your probes attack our ships then? Our probes do not attack. They have only defensive capabilities. Offensive behavior is not part of the instructions we programmed into the probe. To do so would be reprehensible. Okay, so... Okay, right. So where exactly do they get their probes from again? From the Melma May Traveler Traders. It was catalog item 2418. Remote Self-Replicating Robot Explorer Probe, the Economy Model. Right, so we've got a couple of options here. Uh, why did the Melnome sell it to them? Did they give them some cool information? Maybe. The Melnome traded it to us for data on the life on source. They said the information was unique and was worth, oh, I don't really understand their units of exchange. Something like 10,000 Cree dots or something like that. Fortunately, that was exactly the price of their catalog item 2418, Remote Self-Replicating Robot Explorer Probe. Right, uh, how long ago did you get the probe, Slylandro? Two or three hundred rotations, I guess. Right, oh, here we go. What was the probe's program? It was sent on a 500 rotation mission to seek out new life and new civilizations to boldly go for no catalog item 2418, remote self-replicating robot explorer probe had gone before. What a reference! That was uh, that was amazing. How did they must have watched it as well? They must have well, watched Star Trek. We're not hardware people, so we only know the theory. What happens is that while the probe is exploring space, whenever it's not doing something more important, it hunts for asteroids and similar space junk, zaps it into its component parts absorbs the debris, and when it has enough raw materials stored inside, it manufactures a perfect replica of itself. So even though we only bought one probe, by now there should be hundreds of probes, maybe even thousands. Right, so it just keeps like multiplying itself all the time. So sure. what about this probe's program? What would you like to know? We would like to know 
about. But we need to ask them all the questions sure. to get to the point. It was a difficult task for us, since we'd never done anything like that before. But for the most part, we just adjusted his standard program, which went something like scan for targets as defined in target list. If no current target, then select new target from the current targets list using specified priorities. If current position is at current target, then set current behavior to new behavior based on behavior priority settings. Perform current behavior. Okay, that's the basic program. I said it was simple. And here are the tables used by the program. Target list with associated target priority. Space vessel, five. Transmission source, four. Astronomical anomaly, three. Planet bearing life signature, two. Raw replication materials, one. Probe behaviors with assigned priorities. Communicate, five. Record data, four. Analyze data, three. Seek replication materials, 999. Move to current target, one. That's it. Wow, 999, that's quite high. Um, tell us more about the replication behavior, please. I'd be glad to. You see, the probe has the capability to seek out raw materials, process the raw materials into component compounds, collect the compounds, and then, when it has a sufficient supply, it can build a duplicate of itself. We decided that since we had only one probe, we should change the replication priority and crank it up so that there would be more probes sooner. Hopefully they've realized what they've done. What did they set the priority to again? Let's just remind them. Well, the factory setting was two, in between movement at one and analyze data at three. I told Joyce Lifting to set it a bit higher. Let me ask him what he set it to. <gasps> oh, my. That was a bit extreme, wasn't it? Joyce Lifting told me he changed it to 999, the highest setting on the dial. Right, um, what is the effect of priority settings on behavior? I'm pretty sure the way it works is that every time a behavior is completed or interrupted, the program selects a new behavior based on the defined behavior target priorities and what kind of target is currently selected. I think a really high priority would cause a probe to focus its attention on that behavior. Well, I'm going with the first option here. Their probes do destroy ships, and we can prove no, it. it cannot. It is not programmed for hostile behavior. What is your reasoning? Oh my god, they're so stupid. Think about a probe's replication behavior. The probe seeks raw materials and processes them in preparation for replication. Yes, now think about the effect of changing the, the priority. The answer is simple. It would spend more of its time seeking raw materials for its replication process. So what? Now what will happen to a ship given that the replication setting is at maximum? But I'll play along with you. Like I said, alien ships are the top priority target. Once a probe scanned a ship, it would instantly move toward it. Then, when it got to the ship, it would initiate communication automatically. When communications were terminated, a new behavior would be selected, and, uh-oh, a new behavior would be selected. And since the replication setting was set to maximum, the probe wouldn't get time to pick a new target. It would use the current target, the ship, for raw replication materials. It would process the ship, break it into component compounds with electrical discharges. Oh no! What have we done? Traveler, you must tell us what we can do! How can we stop the probes from destroying all life in the galaxy? They were so slow at getting that, weren't they? Jeez, um... Oh, maybe they have a mega self-destruct code. Yes? Why yes, there is! Oh my god, You're there is! Genius, Traveler! Why didn't we remember that? Oh, there's a problem, though. How are we going to transmit the code? Well, while we ponder that problem, at least we can give you the code sequence. That way, if you run into a probe, you can destroy it without getting shot at. 
Well, finally we've got the probe situation sorted out, uh, but now let's just try to actually get to know these guys, because these guys seem pretty interesting. So, uh, who exactly were they again? We are the Sly Landroid, a race of kind, curious, gas bag people. So I wonder if any cool visitors have met them over the years. Years? Oh, you mean drawn. Well, let's see. There was the Mel Norman just a few rotations back, then we go all the way back over three drawn ago to the Earth one and the other no you guys. The Yuli and the Draw, I think. Oh, so they can remember all the way back into the sentient milieu, because the Yuli and the Draw were part hmm. of the milieu. Let me remember. That was a long, long time ago. I was only a nymph then. Oh yes, that's it. The sentient milieu was a cooperative association of sentient alien species. The Yuli, the Draw, the Taelo, the Mailman, the Faz, and the Urquan, who lived across a wide section of the galaxy. They talked with us fairly frequently for almost half a drawn. Then suddenly, the visit stopped, and we haven't heard from them since. Obviously, they didn't hear about the uh, Dinyari um, slave empire. Uh, maybe we don't want to talk yes, about that. There was another race, a highly sophisticated species of shaggy giants who made repeated trips to our world over a period of several drawn. They even installed a broadcasting satellite in orbit around our world which let us talk with them whenever we wanted. They were called the... the... I'm sorry, I can't remember their names. It was a long, long time ago. Oh my god, that's like the precursors! What else could... Oh my god, what were they like? What were the precursors like? I wish I knew more of the information you seek, Traveler. But we last saw the shaggy ones just over 39 drawn ago, and very little from that era has remained intact in our history chance. Hold on a minute. Let me consult with associates Joyce Lifting and Solomon Plunkett. Joyce Lifting, who has a better memory than I, recalls that the shaggy ones were described as being worried. They were always hurrying from place to place, seeking knowledge as though they were in a desperate search for some important secret, some answer to a question that they never shared with us. Solomon Plummet remembers that the last time the shaggy ones visited our world, they came aboard a great circular starship, one even larger than your own. They had discovered their answer and were leaving to go somewhere, and they didn't tell us exactly where somewhere was. Right, what should we ask them now? Um, we, they probably can't remember anything about the Precursors anymore. Um, how long is a Drawn? The Drawn is our primary unit of time. It lasts for an interval equivalent to four million rotations of our planet. A drawn is subdivided into 2,000 Dranasa. Now please, our turn! Will you tell us about yourselves? Oh, okay. Um, we all come from a large rocky world called Earth. Yes, that seems to be the pattern. Just about everyone who comes by here says they developed on a world a lot like that. As far as we know, we're the only sentient species who's ever evolved in the atmosphere of a gas giant. Of course, from what we know, most travelers like yourselves don't have much interest in gas giants. So maybe there are others like Gus Thylandro out there somewhere. And uh, our primary objective is to right now to free ourselves from the Yerkwan. The long brownish guys from the milieu with all the eyes and arms? They used to come visit us regularly about three drones ago. They told us about all the interesting things they found from their scouting missions. They were really nice. Why do you fight with them? These aren't the Urquan you're looking for? Ours agreed. What a quote there. But the Urquan were such good guys. They had lots of interesting things to tell us about. And they never got impatient with our questions. Hmm. Well, I guess a lot can happen to a species in 3 drawn, like turning green and evil. Yep, I think that's exactly what happened, uh, Slylandro. Uh, what was his name again? Content to Hollow. Oh, then you should go check out a planet orbiting a blue star not too far from here. I think there is another blue star right next to it. We can't describe exactly where it is, but the people who told us about it, the Urquan, I think, said that it was one of the rarest worlds in space, and that as far as they knew, 
There were only ten of these planets in this part of the galaxy. Right, so another one of these strange planets that um, this time the Slylandra were talking about. I guess it's um, like similar to the one the Shafixi was talking about, so we have to go check that out now, that'd be cool. Uh, but that's enough about okay, us for now. But please, can we talk about you some more later? Okay, so they probably don't have any more useful information, so let's just say goodbye. Slylandro gas bags, you've been good fun. Um, there we are. Slylandro. Oh, nice. Now that we've got the probe sorted out, they seem like pretty nice guys. They just made a, a fatal error because they had no clue what they were doing. But now, uh, we can have a look around for this blue star. There's a couple down here. There's one to the right there. And there's also some around that big cluster. So there's quite a few blue stars. So I guess over time we'll have a look for some. I don't know. We'll just have a look. Once in a while there's a few blue ones, as I said there, um, around the Draconis and the Podis constellations. That, those, those two constellations kind of mixed together, it's a bit strange, and that Antile one. So, yeah, Battling Draco, I think Commander Hayes is talking about, so we might want to go there, but uh, not right now. Um, right, so let's go into the wild world once again, back in dive space. That was quite a long chat with the uh, Slylandra there. Right. Let's get back into quasi uh, space. First of all, I'm going to use the um, Umgar caster though, uh, because I want to see if I can call the Melnorme. Ah, there they are. The Melnorme are right there, hopefully. They seem to be moving at the same speed as the Melnorme. 